Welcome to the Psycho Vertical Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Kepatrick. Can you hear the the rain falling? I'm in some kind of uh, what do all people call these things? Like those glass houses you have on the side of your house. Uh, what are they called? Anyway, um, I really think I, I'm either I'm either having early onset dementia. And I keep I keep mentioning this, but I keep having like real trouble remembering things like. Like Elizabeth Taylor, I was trying to work. I was trying to remember Elizabeth Taylor's name the other day, but now it just came to me just like that. Um, I used to have, I used to have this problem. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've gone straight into rambling. I should have a little bit of an introduction first. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've always had a real problem with uh, remembering words, and I used to think a good example of this. A good example, if you have trouble with, uh, there's some sort of fancy name for for this. It's like it's like uh, dyslexia. Like it's a stupid name that. It's a name that no one would ever remember about a thing where people can't remember things. Uh, uh, so I, I always have to like associate a different word. So so the word hypocrite, I find that a really hard word to remember. So, but I can remember a hip. So when I need, when I go into my brain and I go to find the word hypocrite, uh, where where the, in the area where that word should be, there's just a big picture of a hip. And for some reason, I always think of Stevie Haston as well. I think. <laughs> I think I think because originally I I was probably using the word hypocrite about Stevie Haston. Hopefully Stevie Haston isn't listening to this because you know. But at the time I, I used to think uh, about Stevie Haston was a hypocrite. <laughs> anyway, so um, I do apologise, Stevie. Well, one day I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. I don't know why. I don't even know why I thought you were a hypocrite. But most people are hypocrites, uh, aren't they? Hopefully, look. I think. I think. I think. Uh, you know, if, if writing's the war against cliches, then life is the war against hypocrites. And yeah, so <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, so welcome back to the Psycho Vertical podcast. So I'm sitting in this glass house, uh, nothing to do with nothing. That's a glass elevator, isn't it? The other one, so uh, a little glass thing. Um, what do all people say? People come around and say, "Oh, do you want to buy a, a thing, a glass thing to live in because you're old." Uh, anyway, I'm in, I'm in one of those things, and I'm in Galway, in Ireland, and uh, I'm I'm cocooned here. That's what they call it, cocooned, in Ireland uh, for house arrest. And they like I, I really love the way the uh, language is like so interesting how people use it. Like the other day, there was an advert on the television, and it was for like stuff that you know, like like lamb or some kind of stuff you get out of a field. And instead of saying the word farmer, they said producer. You know, these are these are brought to you by producers instead of by farmers. And I wonder if this is. I wonder if like someone makes a decision, we're going to stop using the word farmer because it's a bit masculine, and we're going to start using the word producer instead. And I think a better a better way to. I think instead of getting really instead of producers, it just sounds like someone who's got like loads of. You know, like rubber gloves on and like a, one of those hats stop your hair from falling into stuff like chopping up things and throwing them in boxes. I like the, I think we should start calling farmers um, landscape stakeholders. So I think that's a much, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a more um, inclusive and uh, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, so I find, I find language like all that kind of stuff. Is uh is very increasingly I'm finding it very interesting the way people talk about stuff. Anyway, so uh, I'm cocooned I'm cocooned in Galway. Uh, someone someone said someone asked that I've these podcasts have been been very uh have not been very talking about the thing everyone else is talking about, and a few people have said that I should do things that I could do things while the thing is going on. And, uh, you know, I could like, I should like leverage the thing because there's lots of people sitting around doing nothing, but it's a, it's probably a failing of mine, but I really don't like sort of exploiting terrible things going on just to, you know, to, for my brand or whatever. I just, I just can't, I just can't, can't bring myself to do it. So, uh, yeah, like I should be doing like loads of podcasts and, you know, singing like Imagine, get like me, Stevie Haston, Conrad Anker, Alex Magos, get us all. Imagine all the people 
you know, that'd be, that would be really, really cool, I think. Uh, Grimer could do it. Grimer's the kind of person who would do stuff like that. He'll be, I, I bet he's baking cakes and filming himself. Uh, I was going to say the word wanking then, but I won't say that because like kids might be listening to this. Uh, and that probably brings us into some of my housekeeping. Uh, someone has uh, contacted me, one of my uh, my many listener, and he said that uh, I was listening to episode 16. And I think it's the second time you mentioned masturbating in front of a camera for money. So that's kind of a little bit alarming because I just hope I'm not talking about like crampons and, and prussic loops on my other podcast. So thanks to uh, Jan Jasset. Is that a real name? Jasset? Anyway, I think people make these names up. Because I, I know I do, because none of these are real people. I'm just making them up. So, yeah, it's really, it's, if when you make up imaginary letters from people, it's always really, it's always really difficult to get the names right. And also, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna do them and send them into magazines, like you're answering them, uh, don't spell. Don't, if you're really bad at spelling, people can always tell because you spell yes, you spell them wrong. That's why you need a good editor. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd be, today's a, a higher education episode of this podcast where I'm going to go through a load of inane, kind of boring questions that people have sent me, like how long is a piece of rope and stuff like that. I made that one up, and uh, like loads of stuff. And then I'll I'll I'll, I'll read through them, and uh, it'll be none of nothing, nothing will make any sense because it's not really good for the radio. Uh, but I did I, actually today. I was having a funny. Uh, f- I've had two funny memories. So this friend of mine, Paul Ramsden, who he won the Pile d'Or. I think he's won the Pile d'Or more than anybody else alive, which is not difficult because nearly everyone's dead who's, who's won it. Um, and he is a like a really good climber. Isn't he? Wouldn't if you met him, you wouldn't think he was a really good climber. He's just like a miserable kind of Yorkshire Yorkshire type person. Like if he was in, do you know, like if you if you made. Do you know you? Do you know when you make if you made like a climbing version of Game of Thrones, then someone like Adam Ondra, he would be like one of the main characters, and you know Chris Bonington would be one of the you know the old the old what well, well, wasn't man you know in the in the thing and and, and uh, but Paul Ramson would probably be a guy in the back of a crowd or something like maybe a guy with a pike probably um, you know so he's not is when you meet him like. You know, he's an, he's an incredible climber, incredible mountaineer. But when you meet him, you won't re- you won't really realise it. But he's, he's actually a very formative person in my life. I've had lots of I've had lots of crap climbing trips with him. But as a human being, uh, he's, he's kind of he's he's very he's very interesting. He doesn't I don't think he gets any free gear for anybody because he doesn't really tell anybody what he does. He doesn't write books or blog or whatever. He just kind of does his own. He does his own thing, but he's is, he's is probably one of the people in, I've met in my life who has probably had one of the more interesting lives. Lots of he's done a lot of interesting things. He's actually a health and safety person. So when he used to climb a lot with McFarrell, so he had like a taxman and a health and safety person going off together. But um, you know, he seems to get he seems to end up in like Yemen and all sorts of. It's like a it's like a top end like a like a James Bond version of a health and safety person. Uh, so he's done anyway. So he's he's, ta- he's taught me a few things. He's, few, he's got some really good lines. Like one one of his lines is, "It's like this is for your business. We might not be good, but we're cheap." That was that was something I've always kept in kept in mind. But for some reason, well, this this week he he sent me a message that like we don't seem to communicate very much, and he sent me a message about something. I think he wanted to know about abseiling abseiling on a thin rope, like if, you know, it's about using a really thin rope, like a, like an, using a nine mil lead rope and then like a five mil, six mil abseil rope. So I sent him the, uh, the advanced, the advanced chapter of my, uh, of down. Don't want to keep talking about down, but I, anyway, that's all I thought. That's why I'm, that's why I'm going senile because my head is just literally full of stupid knots and prussic loops and friction, friction hitches. I said, and also lanyards. I also realise I have not actually. I'm, I'm still. I've not been talking about lanyards much. I reckon it's because of, you know, because of this whole thing. Uh, and I know people keep contacting me like, "When's the lanyard edition coming?" And I've decided I might actually make it into like a CD-ROM and just go like totally retro or a beta. On put it on a beta cassette tape or something. It's gonna. But it's but it is that is coming because you know I've been I've been storing up, you know, like basically in this in down there's. 
there must be a good 50,000 words just on lanyards. Uh, not that's, That doesn't include uh, those Purcell, Prusik things, what we call them. So anyway, so, so Paul Ramsden contacted me and I sent him the, the advanced chapter of this book and he replied that he thought he knew everything. <laughs> he, he prided himself on knowing everything about climbing, but he's realised he doesn't doesn't know as much as he, th- as he thought because there was all sorts of stuff, probably stuff I'd made up that probably wasn't relevant to what he wanted. But but it, but for some reason, uh, well, two things. First first of all, uh, I think I made a joke today about hemorrhoids, about having about having some tweet about hemorrhoids. Uh, I've never had hemorrhoids, but. Uh, I can imagine what it's probably like giving birth. I can imagine what it's like to have hemorrhoids. I think it's I think it's like a genetic a genetic thing. But Paul Ramsden told me the story about a friend of his. Uh, who, I think he was in I think he was in Antarctica. I think he worked for British Antarctic Survey, and th- there was a guy there who was always telling everybody about his friends at the Brennan, like Plassey Brennan. If you don't if you don't live in the UK, Plassey Brennan is like a you know, famous outdoor centre. It's full of like hard men. You know, people. You know, instructor types. You know, my fucking miserable. And uh, you know, all these instructor types, and uh, they're all anyway. So this guy was always saying like, "Oh, my friends at the Brennan. Uh, oh yeah, my friends at the Brennan. Oh yeah, my friends at the Brennan." So eventually, everyone got so pissed off with this that they started calling hemorrhoids. <laughs> My friends at the Brennan, so they'd be like, "Oh God, my friends at the Brennan," and "Oh God, it's oh my friends at the Brennan are bleeding," all that kind of stuff. And I always, I always, so whenever when anybody ever mentions hemorrhoids, it always makes me laugh. So, um, so yeah, I think yeah, what, uh, <laughs> yeah, so so having having returned from the Middle East, I don't know if I'm going back to the Middle East. I've got to see what what if I if we ever go anywhere else again. So I'm not sure what's going on. On with that kind of thing, and I, I seem I'm kind of missing it. I, it although, it's, although it's a total shit all, uh, I am kind of I am kind of missing it. But uh, Paul Paul said in this email, like, "Oh, going to live in the Middle East did it change your politics?" And uh, it, uh, yeah, I, it just just like it's the second person this week to to mention my politics, and I and I am one of these people. If you ever look, if anybody ever says, "Oh," You know, oh, and Andy Kirkpatrick. I don't agree with everything he says, but and they always seem to have this this kind of thing about my politics. But I don't really have. I don't think I really have any. Like I've said before, I'm, I'm politically agnostic. But um, but yes, yeah, so it made me. I think I'm. I might have to try and work out what they. I think I probably. I think probably at the moment, everything that's going on with the thing is only confirming my my <laughs> my view of the world and society and everything else so we, we we shall see um so anyway so so that's that's the story about hemorrhoids I thought i'd get that in uh, at the beginning so is that all my uh anyway what uh final little bit of housekeeping now i was gonna do i was gonna do this as a video and have it on youtube because there's a few things i have to i was going to actually physically manhandle nothing to do with the wanking stuff i was going to physically manhandle things and point at things but i just couldn't be asked doing it so uh i don't know why i even i even i even had my 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 face all the hair on my face cut down to a more manageable levels so you could see my face but i I still not still not get around to it seems a bit i think you kind of have to have a you need to have a bit of a studio thing like i'm definitely going into the world of the world of uh of youtube and i'm gonna must because as i said i'm a, recently my kids have got no future anymore so i'm i'm, I'm you know it's mainly for them i'm doing it but i need i think i just want it to be i think if i'm going to do it properly i want it i want to do it properly you know i want to have like a massive studio i want to be like joe rogan but like a climbing version of joe rogan but with no guests and just you know, just like a shit version of Joe Rogan with no guests and just carabiners and knots instead. So, like, it's, you do end up with this kind of weird relationship because I have this, I have a mental, I have a mental block about about um, pulley systems and one to twos and three to fours and sixteens to whatever, and I always get it wrong. So whenever I do an in a diagram, and I I think the diagram in one of my books is wrong, but I, whenever I do a diagram. I like stick it up on Instagram or something, and 
immediately it's like, oh, that's not a two to one, that's a 17 to one or something. And I'm like, oh God. And uh, it's very, very, I find it very annoying really because a lot, you know, like, I, like, it's not like I don't understand how it works. It's not like I don't, I haven't done it. Like I've, I've hauled like an unbelievable amount of shit around up big walls and stuff, you know, like, you know, just crazy amounts of weight and everything else. But I just have a problem with like remembering what, knowing what it's all, what it's called and how it like, like I only work, we'll find out what a square number was like this year. So give me a break. So yeah. So um, anyway, so, so yeah, so, but yeah, but when you, when, so whenever I'm like, oh, I've got this wrong, this, this thing, like a, a lot of problems is you know what something is and you've used it and you know it works but you don't know what it's called. So you end up having to go on YouTube. So I would say, like if you're setting up, so I was right this week I was writing uh, a bit in the book about, uh, so it's all about abseiling basically. And and in the, there's a chapter uh, called, what's it called? It's called uh, Problem Solving. And in it, it's got like, you know, ropes are stuck, all that kind of, all those rope stuck kind of things, which are the main problems. But then it's got, like a section on like if the ropes don't reach the anchor, you know, your ropes too short or whatever and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, but there's quite a few things where I, like, I, I know what they are and I know how it, I know I've done it myself. I don't really know what you'd call it. So, um, Pete Whitaker, I remember listening to Pete Whitaker interview I did with him on this podcast, you know, he was saying how to make all these names up, which is, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I think he's had, he had ones like called riding the donkey or, you know, you know, tickling the squirrel and all this kind of stuff. But I, it's, it's not, it's quite hard to come up with a really fun, you know, integrated, you know, integrated bowline. So it's not quite the same. You can't really come up with, you know, zigzag carabiner break. You know, it's like, it's not that exciting. So, <coughs> so, um, uh, what was my point? So I was going, so, so uh, in this chapter about problem solving, uh, yeah, so, I, so I had a, I, I've got a bit, of, I got a bit, like if someone's hanging on a rope, I generally if someone's hanging on a rope and you have to haul them up, you know, it's always like on a, <coughs> if you're on a, in a crevasse or, you know, that kind of story. But it's actually quite difficult if you're, when you're abseiling, because basically the person is out on the end, down there on the rope somewhere and you have almost, you have no rope apart from the tails at the, be, at your, at the your end and you have to somehow kind of haul, haul them back up again. Which is actually quite a good, uh, like you know, like get out of that kind of problem. And uh, in the in the diagram in the description, I just talk about setting up a a, a separate haul system, haul line, uh, like a hauling so piggy. I call it like a piggyback haul where you use a separate piece of cord from the actual ropes. So you're not using the ropes to haul, uh, and it, because you know the ropes are thinner, so they have less less tend to have less uh, less friction on them, and they're also sort of semi-static where you know if you if you're hauling on on climbing ropes they're more stretchy and all that kind of stuff so but yeah but it's very hard to come up with any name so you end up like going on youtube and like trawling through all these videos trying to work out what something's called and you'll you'll see you know people will call there's like 20 names for everything and as soon as you call it one thing someone's like oh in tree surgeons call it you know stick up your ass pulley system or something and you're like oh christ everyone's got a bloody opinion so yeah i'm out of a big thing at the beginning of the book like everything in this book is wrong let's <laughs> just take it let's take it for as read everything in this book is wrong but if you can find something that makes you know that's useful then so be it uh but i do i do i do want to get the note i do you do have to get stuff right that's the problem because once it's printed it's out there now this book i i can i really feel like it's going to become like a, the book people buy. Like when I was when I was started climbing, it was probably Nigel Shepard's Modern Ropes Techniques, Modern Rope Techniques, which is like the book everyone seemed to have. And I think this will be like one of those one of those kind of books. Although I think it's probably going to end up being a lot bigger than that book. But uh, so yes, yeah, so it has to be. You know, <laughs> like I'm not I'm not like who's that? Who was the who was the person who wrote that? Is it not Langmuir? What's it, what's those Freedom of the Hills? You know, all those books that you know when you're doing your when people have qualifications and this kind of thing, they have to buy the, these books and they have to read them and like, oh yes, yes, it's 15, 15 paces, you know, you know, it's like really, oh Christ, you know, I just can't, I'm not, yes, you shouldn't lock's foot, uh, that's highly dangerous. 
Uh, you know, that you're reading something from 1952, you know, like, you know, she should never be like with a ventile anorak. Um, so, so yeah, so, so some of the, some of the, luckily some of the stuff, so I have thing, I have this thing called a Murphy sling, which is like a, a way of like backing up a, an anchor, like an abseil anchor, where you just, each pair just locks, just does a lock's foot into it with a, with a sling. And everyone who's seen it's like, oh, you, you can't do that. You can't lock foot into a into a sling. It's like really, really dangerous. And it's like, no, actually, it's actually okay now. We, we, after 40 years being told not to do it, it turns out it's okay. So we just got it wrong. And it's and so I'll have lots of uh, stuff like that. So people like, either it's like cutting edge and people don't know it's right or it is wrong and it'll kill somebody. So that's the problem with trying to get the balance, balance between the two. So... So anyway, so I should. Uh, so anyway, so for watching all these videos, you you realise you end up with these, you know, is it Mike Barter? I can't remember his name now. I've met him in Canada, but you know, you've, there's all these people on on YouTube who do these videos uh, that you've end up you've watched them so many times. That guy who does like the there's a guy who's like some kind of, you know, he looks like he's probably owns an M16 and you know builds his own cars and stuff, and he's like doing, you know, these like things with like pulleys and stuff and and this is a two to one this is a five to one and all that kind of stuff and but you watch it so many times you really feel like you're you're having a relationship with this person and you know when you when you first started watching it there was only you know there's like 50 views and now you go back and it's like five million views so it's amazing how when something's out there for such a long time how it becomes you know it just becomes like really famous it's like uh like spinal tap or something it's like something everyone's everyone's seen it so especially at the moment like everyone is watching the most like obscure you know obscure you know stuff and so yeah it's kind of uh it's kind of interesting so anyway so let's let's crack on with these uh these questions uh that people have been sent sending me um but if you want to so I, I think i think i've got how many let's have a look i've got my computer up in here i don't know uh, how many follow, how many, how many, where's my thing, your videos, where's my, oh dear, where's my channel, god, there's another question, first off, risk of sounding like a punter, yeah, I'm going to read, I'm going to read that one out, I love it when people say, like, start the sentence, like, you know, oh my god, oh my god, oh god, it's me talking, uh, how many, let's, let's have a look, how many, god, this is not very professional, I really, I really need to have some notes, uh, and know what I'm going to say, oh god, so I've got one, I got 1,000, 1,650, is that right? 1,650 followers. So anyway, so if I can get, if I can get it up to 2,000, then that'll be, that'll, so that this is me now exploiting the thing. Just, just go and just click it, like never go and watch any of these films that be shit, but basically it'll just, it just helps me to, to be asked to, to do this kind of, to get on with it really, because I'll feel like someone's going to be watching it. Um, anyway, we'll st- actually we'll start with this question. This is like totally live. This is live. Oh god, it's quite long. You might be, this is this is like I'm going to read this question. This live question. I hope it doesn't go into something uh, weird or anything. Uh, uh, I'll, I better miss that bit out. Uh, now I'll read it. What the hair? So, <laughs> so hey Andy. First off, at the risk of sounding like a punter. In brackets, I'm Canadian. You're welcome. I wanted to give you a true thanks for all the content you've shared. You're welcome. From books, films, podcasts, and random posts. This sounds like the type of thing I've actually written to myself here. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I would love to follow you on your on your YouTube channel. Where can I find a link to it? Thank you very much. Uh, um, your, your stories of heart, uh, Dan, Don Juan, sort of where Don Juan, is he some kind of porn star? I don't know. And the raw style of your films and edited, blah, blah, blah. I don't want it's all about me. Very much. Prefer. I have learned uh, more useful things from your blogs, techniques, archive than I could from any climbing technique book ever released. Well, I hope that's not true because what, I've released some quite good books. Um, that was, oh, that was until Higher Education came out. And for that, I uh, will give you the biggest thanks. You're welcome. It was very expensive, so you're welcome twice. My climbing partner and I, with no true aid climbing or big wall experience, have brought the book and without even practicing, it, practicing together, just corresponding online, that's the way they do it. Uh, he lives in a different continent, 
fair enough, um, America, uh, was showing up in Yosemite, and we were successful on our first walls, the west face of Leaning Tower, easy, um, then Zodiac, a little bit harder, without bailing, and undoubtedly with far less flailing around than if we were up there figuring it out for hours without your hardware and one lessons. Looking forward to down, but unlike all the others probably hurrying you, I should take you should take your sweet time. I am, but it's not sweet. It's like a nightmare. Uh, so now to the question. So I hope you. I hope you're feeling this. This is like edgy stuff, isn't it? Like I'm really. This is like a live, yet recorded. You know. You know. Live action uh, answering questions. Q and A. Uh, all right, enough spraying of gratitudes. My question is simply, if you're considering to do a Zoom slideshow, a Zoom slideshow? on a climb or expedition that you haven't written too much about, uh, would be very cool to see and hear more detail on how to choose the objective, the travel, the gear, technical climbing, and the places walls. I have no doubt that this would be a pain in the ass, yes, to set up, yes, but I know the right 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 now there's a ton of people could just use some inspiration and maybe you could do one instead of a two week of or we blah, blah, blah. anyway just an idea that i thought of after watching a few of steve house's live slideshow stories where i was thinking yes i would blah 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 so oh yeah so yeah steve house he has been doing some uh good um uh, zoom things i don't know if you they must be on youtube maybe and I like, I think I kind of came into one and he was a little bit like, where, where is everybody? I've done it myself. When you do things, when you do like quick Q and A, I do something like, like live and there's like nobody there, you know, like I am 12. What is this? You know, like there's no, there's no one there. And he's like, oh, this is pointless. But, uh, Steve's, you know, um, Steve's thing is like dead good. It's like him just like talking about his expedition, all the little tiny stuff that you can, you can never really do in a normal slideshow because you haven't got much time to do all it's all the it's all the little nitty gritty things that are always really interested like what kind of rice you buy in a market and all that kind of stuff um uh final final bit of this email and last just wanted to share this only one so he wants to share a film with me about some guy in sarah Torre. uh oh, that's good so so it wasn't really a was it a question yeah so anyway so so no i'm not gonna do that um <laughs> Yeah, maybe I will. Because I've not, I've not really talked about, I've never, ne- not actually talked that much about uh, going to Denali uh, last year. Uh, although we're on Denali in February for about eight, eight weeks or something, I haven't really talked about it or written anything about it. So maybe that, that might be an interesting thing to do. Maybe I'll get Vanessa. Maybe, maybe me and Vanessa will do a, a Zoom together because she's, you know, she she isn't really a mountaineer. So to be up on Denali uh was uh was kind of interesting as an aside actually see if i can find this email because i'm gonna i'm gonna what do you call it when you when you like really like shit on someone um uh roast is it roasting someone uh what is it where uh, oh god anyway i can't find it but anyways i i i, I did actually what well, i did have this this, mo- this thing where i wanted to I wanted to write about it. I had this idea about writing a uh, like a an article. Uh, okay, okay, I'm trying to find it because it's quite funny. Uh, I have I have a terrible thing where I have a terrible. I've got a very short. Never got a short temper. Hmm, maybe, but it doesn't it doesn't manifest itself as in like. Going, going like violence or being uh, whatever. Oh, is it there? Is it there? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, this is. I should like. I'll just edit this bit out because it's. Uh, I'm trying to find because again, like I'm trying to remember someone's name, but I can't remember his name, so I'm trying to find his email. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so this is an email to to the to the editor of, of a famous uh, magazine. Um, <laughs> So I basically wrote him like saying like like hi you know you know me you know I've written um you know I'm 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 you know uh so it's got I saw so like hi living in the gulf at the moment waiting for the bombs to drop it was during when the the Iran thing was going on but I was thinking it would be fun to write something for a magazine about trying to climb Denali in winter with my wife 
who had only climbed Mont Blanc before. We got up to Camp 5, but turned around after we ran out of food and she got CO, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Going up there in winter with a novice might sound stupid, but the ranger said it was a pre- pretty much the perfect trip. Well, apart from not getting, not, get, not getting to the top, thought it might be an interesting read. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought, like... I thought they might they might be interested in it because, like, I'm a, a kind of written a lot of stuff, you know, award-winning writer, uh, you know, the all all this kind of stuff. I thought, like, I, like I'm not like a, an idiot. Like, I'm not going to write something, you know. I'm going to write something. Hopefully, write something interesting about it, and, and it's not going to be the typical, you know, typical climbing-related thing. Um. So, but basically, um. Oh damn! I can't find his answer. Uh, his 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 answer was oh yeah. Uh, no, I can't find it. Oh, sorry. But basically, basically, his answer was that they didn't want to publish something which might be construed as someone taking his girlfriend uh, up to Nali in the winter time, and that he was a real hero and she was like a novice. Because it would uh, it would play to like gender stereotypes, and uh, basically, no, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to do it because we're afraid of you know the backlash of writing something like that. So, <laughs> so basically, it was like I just basically said, uh, you need to give up your job as an editor, like uh, uh, you know, like just uh, I, I won't read what I wrote to him, but I just I just totally uh, I just totally went crazy at him so <laughs> and then and then I kind of uh I probably didn't even I think he said like calm down I think he actually his reply was like calm down geez Andy take a pill and uh and uh yeah but I do I do I think like I'd, you know I just I, I just find that kind of thing you know I just find that kind of thing crazy because the thing is this the, what I was going to write was it was in no way making me out to be a hero it was, it was to make me out to be a fucking complete imbecile and my wife being the complete hero who was like super tough and super able like it would have been a really great piece of writing that made you know if you're like you know like at the moment like you, you hear so many stuff where where editors are like um publishers are like we need r- more writing by women and basically we'll publish anything no matter how shit it is because we just need something and the same with events like we have these like we have these like five mountaineers doing this thing but they're all men we need some women but we can't find any women who are will who will do it or are available to do it because so so if, you know for me it's like an opportunity for someone to write something about a woman doing something that's like super hardcore and her being super on it and super capable but instead it, it's nothing it doesn't get written because you know, I don't. I don't think I even wanted to get paid for it. I just thought it'd be interesting to write something like that for like for a magazine again because I don't really write for magazines. And yeah, it just so it just it just made me so pissed off because it just it just it's this lowest common denominator. It just assumes I'm just gonna write this like puff piece about myself, which is not what I do really. And uh, yeah, so like it made it made me think at the time. I just need to start my own magazine, but luckily I kind of got luckily I got over that. So, so yeah. So maybe maybe we will do like a zoom, a zoom kind of thing about maybe that trip or uh, or some of so some trips like the trip to an my trip to Antarctica was a uh, was is like a is like a textbook textbook thing about team dynamics and how bad they can go and uh, having to sort of try and you know deal with deal with all sorts of stuff going on with people. Uh, but I just, but sometimes you just can't talk about these things until everyone's died. So I'll have to say, I'll have to save that one. Hopefully, I'm the last man, last man standing. But uh, like every every trip you do, always has some really interested, always has some really interesting uh, lessons you can like pass on to to other people. Uh, in in the in uh, the down book, there's a there's a chapter on uh, uh, communication because uh, like communication is really important when you're descending a mountain it's covered all sorts of stuff like just just from the communicating normally between two people when you're absent down a mountain to also also 
the thing that you should always communicate to each other when something's wrong or when you think something's wrong. You shouldn't just stay quiet. You know, the classic thing is you're not very experienced and you see someone who is experienced doing something really dangerous, like clipping into one rope rather than two ropes at an abseil, and you're like, oh, that's, oh, maybe I should say something, but maybe he obviously knows what he's doing and then he's like, and he's gone. So, so yeah, so the, so the, the nature of, a lot of the nature of mountaineering literature and and the culture i think is actually not about the art of it and making money out of it and all that kind of stuff it's uh it's it's the it's the it's the passing on of uh, information so my wife is like annoying me just fuck off she's looking through the window at me trying to annoy me trying to put me off so um you know, it's the, I was just on a good point there as well. And she's like, to, you know, I was going to start singing. But, you know, but it is, but it's about, you know, it begins with people like in a pub or in the olden days in a pub and people will be telling all these stories about experiences and you have all these anecdotes. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's how it, that's how it kind of uh, started off really. So, you know, the, I think we get, we probably have less of a culture of that, you know, firsthand. Like now it's a culture of people, you know, like a million, you have to read through like 50 posts about a knot and then you'll find some, you know, something really interesting. But you'll get someone who is um, like Werner Braun, you know, who's like been in charge of like Yosemite Mountain Rescue for a hundred years and he'll he'll say something and the next person will be like, you don't know what you're talking about, mate, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you have to kind of filter it out. Where in a, in a pub, you used to have a much more, um, like there was a more of a hierarchy and I think I re- I'm a really big fan of hierarchy. Don't want to. I don't want to get all like Jordan Peterson on you, but I, like I am a really big fan of hierarchies and climbing hierarchies are really are really important. Like you have to, you know, you have to know your place and you want to aspire to be, you know, move up the hierarchy. And you know, you let people who generally generally the people who people would look up to in the past we generally people with a lot of experience. So when they were you know they had more they had more freedom to speak because what they said probably did have more va- did have more value like there's a re- there's a really one of my favorite stories of all time is Johnny Dawes the famous Johnny Dawes he he did this slideshow and he was talking about fear and he said uh is anybody here like has anybody here ever been really really afraid and this guy's like yeah yeah I, I have and he goes like do you, want, do you want to tell us about it do you want to like sh- share your story and the guy's like yeah 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 I, I will yeah he said, "Yeah, I was like, I was on this uh, this mal severe, and Johnny's like, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about.'" <laughs> he just like took the microphone off him. So, so yeah, so back. So anyway, so, so I, I, I shall look into it. Thank you for that. Thank you for that message. Um, I, thought, I thought it was going to be something more more exciting to read out, but never, never, never. Next time I do this, uh, everyone <laughs> send me messages. The more messages I send, the more chances it might arrive when I'm actually uh, doing this. So, um, uh, dear Andy, love the podcasts, especially the tea breaks. I didn't have any tea today. Uh, I have a question that I'm hoping you've got so much crap on my wind on my on my windscreen on my computer screen. I can't see what the words are. I have a question that I'm hoping you might be able to answer in your podcast. I shall see. I am more of a hiker. Oh God, I'm going to stop stop reading there. there. <laughs> I'm more of a hiker than a climber, so this might be really basic. I'm sure it will be. Apart from crossing a glacier, traversing a narrow ridge where if one person falls, they either can jump down the opposite side, or if anchors are being used, when, if ever, when, if ever, is it a good idea to be roped up in a team? It just seems to me that it means that if one person falls, that everyone else goes too. Uh, good up, good up the good work. Best regards, Matthew. Now, that is actually a very good question. Now, Ma- Matthew, you are a hiker, but that is a good question. This type of question hikers ask uh, and climbers, climbers don't. So, being tied to another person. Yeah, that is a... That is a Mm, that is a, that is always a, that's always a, always a tricky a tricky thing. Now that is one good reason why you want to go climbing. You want you don't want to go hiking. And like Mick Fowler, want uh, Mick Fowler, one of the best bits of advice 
any climber is ever going to give another climber, well, not a climber, an alpinist, uh, which is like a climber who wants to kill themselves, is stick to the buttresses. Now, once you get once you go off the buttresses and you start going up the couloirs and you start going up the the other stuff, the easy stuff, that's when it gets really, really dangerous. Because when you're on a buttress, you invariably always have a good a good B layer. You always have some kind of B layer. And you generally have gear in between. Now in all my life climbing um you know, climbing and stuff, I can only think of like well, I probably I probably blocked it out, but I can only think of a very few occasions where I couldn't find a B layer and people you know i had to like we had to like climb together to find some something and i always i think i always i, I don't think i ever had a belay where i was really like hey god if this person falls on this belay it's gonna it's gonna you know i'm gonna we're gonna die or something i think i think like again like mick fowler someone someone told me early on that mick fowler was really really good at finding protection so you know someone probably told me that when i was like 20 or something so I always thought like that's what I had to get good at was finding protection, and I and I have always been very good at finding protection and you know sort of hanging out in there and not not putting up with like really really crappy belays. Uh, like on some of, some of the, you know, I've got like photographs when we when we tried to climb the Russian route on the Eiger, you know, and we've got like belays, you know, that are, that are totally insane. You know, we have you know, like like bed beaks and you know all this stuff. You know, you have like. This you know, hugely complicated B layer, you know, because you're just not, it's, you know, it's not part of the game is to have a B layer that's gonna, you're gonna die, you know, hauling on. So, so, the, so yeah, so I would, say, you know, if you're a hiker and if you're a climber, just get straight onto the technical stuff. Don't be messing around with, you know, when people say I'm going to the Alps and I'm gonna do like the Gervis Sutty Cool War or something, I'm like, why? Why are you gonna do that? Like, don't climb something that people can ski down, basically. That's, it's just pointless, you know, like maybe in the olden days, like my dad, when he was climbing, like in the sixties, he was, he was saying that, you know, things which are now like the descent gully that would take them like all day to climb it because it'd be like chopping steps up there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, once people started using crampons front pointing more then you know, it kind of, the game changed, but there's not, there's no reason why I should, so anyone should be climbing, these routes that haven't got any belays, haven't got any runners in them, you know, unless unless you're just like kind of incompetent, but but then it it leads on to the in like mountaineering and the same like I don't, I just can't see like mountaineering just seems like so dangerous to me. It just seems like I went to see a slideshow by a guy who was like the first Commonwealth man to climb all the eight thousand meter peaks just seemed like fucking insanity like what he was doing and how many people were dying doing it and uh you know if you're a if you're a guide and you're t- and you have like clients then it is is it is actually amazing how much you know just like pulling someone at the right moment can actually stop them uh you know from falling off and uh that kind of security but often it's like a false insecurity like when I've been climbing with people where you just tie together and there isn't really any gear like going up a snow slope or something. You know, you often have to just say, like, you do realise like if you fall off, you're gonna die, and you're gonna pull me off as well. Like there's no no way I can stop you. And people will be like, What oh, really? Oh my god, I didn't realise. So so there is the the rope can like lull you into this false insecurity. Uh and you know, I, I don't know if you ever heard that saying, like, where there's rope, there's hope. And that is that is kind of true. Uh like if two people are falling down a mountain. There's a lot of spiky things on a mountain, uh, you know, and, and ropes do seem to have a habit of like catching on them. Like people, some people like tumble all the way down and you basically get wrapped up in the rope and you, that's, that's one of the things that can kill you is that you're just like sort of crushed and suffocated by your, by your rope. Um, so, yeah. So for, for me, like climbing with, so say like when I was on, say I was on Denali with last year. So we had, we had a rope and, you know, there's one point where I, f- I started falling down the mountain because uh, my boots were so big and uh, I had to do an ice axe arrest. And if I hadn't, I would have just w- yanked Vanessa off. And I don't think we would have died, but it wouldn't it wouldn't have been a very good outcome, whatever, whatever happened. So, you know, if you know, so that's a good example of why it's a bad idea. But then other times when you're like on Denali, there's like a, you go, you know, go up, go up this ridge 
Uh, and the ridge is like very, very easy, but it's still, you know, like that. I don't know if it's the same in the summertime, in the wintertime, it's like very, very icy. Uh, you know, you you really are, like, you know, you're just using your, you know, your, your, your crampons. You, re- you really need like good solid like crampons to, to get to get up there. Um, and you know, when you when you're tied to the other person, you are, you know, you. You know, most of the time you're you're trying to find you know slings for spikes, and there's lots of like stuff sticking out. There's lots of snow stakes on Denali, so you're like clipping into those. So you're kind of moving together, um, and it means that you can give assistance to the other person. You know, like all those classic skills that are worth developing on easy stuff like scrambling. You know, like just like you, you can you can pr- you produce quite a lot of force by just putting the rope around a rock and just you know like around a spike and kind of. You know, doing like a direct belay off a spike of rock and uh, various various kind of things. Um, so the so the you know like the rope is like really really important uh, in that kind of situation. But there are but you do get to the point where like as as Marks as uh, Matthew says, you know when you're on a ridge, you always have this like this idea that if someone falls, you can just jump off the over the, over, over the other side. Like whether whether you ever did people have done it, but whether you you know whether you could do it. I know it's, it's a different thing, but it, in my experience, when people fall when they're mountaineering, it's not like a climbing fall. It's it's always like stumbles and trips and and that kind of thing. And it begins as like a slow motion slow motion fall. So if you're if you're kind of attentive, there is there is the chance that you could like stop somebody from like slight you know sliding down, falling off, falling off something. But I think a lot, a lot of the times in the in the mountains you wear you're having this rope because of crevasses. That's the main that's the main kind of reason. But you definitely you definitely don't want to be you basically want to be with someone who is happy, you know, happy to solo. Uh, you, you know, could solo up there and they'd be and they'd be fine. You don't want to be tied to someone who isn't who isn't sort of confident on the feet and is like stumbling around and uh everything else i guess in i guess in reverse it would be would a little bit be a bit like let's both ski down this couloir this like steep couloir and we'll both tie together like at what at what angle couloir you're happy to go down with another person like you don't you'd only go down like a steep couloir like if you if you're just going down like a you know a black slope or something that'd be quite scary if you didn't really trust the person but if you're going down something that's like 40 degrees then you know, you really have to trust that person that they're not going to fuck up. And even then, there's always a risk they're going to fuck up. So, but gen- generally, you're, you're, you've, you're, the mountains got your attention when you when you're moving together and you haven't got anything else uh, between you. Uh, like, like like little things, you know, little things like make, making the most of the terrain, uh, like having some slings if there's a spike sticking up or. Or zigzagging around, or or knowing knowing when to stop. Like even if you don't have a belay, you know sometimes you, it's best to stop at a good a, a good point, bring the other person up, and then swap over. Uh, like if you're tired, if you're trying to rush, if you're being rushed. Like if the person in the front is a lot better than you, then sometimes you can feel like you're being pulled too fast. Uh, but also the person that be beh- behind is generally getting an easy ride because the other person at the front is is kicking steps. Like this leads into my the next question here, but uh you know like if you're like if you're on an ice slope and and you're moving together like say you say like a, a route like the north face of the Dwats or something or the Lagarde couloir or something on the Dwats uh like the north face of the Dwats has got like a you know maybe it's like 500 meters of or maybe longer than that of sort of 40 45 degree ice ice nevis or snow slope thing and if you're not going to be lay up, if you're not going to be lay together up there, then you should. Then you're probably best like soloing, you know, soloing up that, soloing up there, soloing up and have one rope each, or just carry one rope. And uh, the, ideally, the person at the front should always have the rope so they can send it down to the person, uh, person below. And but like on a, on a route like the the Guard Couloir or some of the like big couloirs in the Alps. There's always there's always places to play like what you know is 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 technical enough that there is rock around, and yeah maybe in the past people didn't have as much gear so they would just you know like solo up there tied together with a rope and every now and again they might make a belay but if you've got like a good if you've got a good enough rack 
then you should be able to always find some kind of beeler, uh, you know, carry some, you know, carry a snow stake and not learn how to use a snow stake and, and various, you know, forms of protection. Um, but so I would say, I would say, yeah, I'd say, you know, rope is good. Where there's rope, there's hope. And, uh, like if you're not willing to tie on on with somebody, then maybe you shouldn't be climbing with that person either. And if you're not, if, you, if it's a catch twenty two, like if if they need a rope, then you shouldn't be climbing with them. But if you have, but you don't want to tie, it, don't be tied to them, then you shouldn't be climbing with them either. So it's a it's a it's a tricky one really. But it's not the thing is about mountaineering and the thing about life as we are discovering at the moment is uh, life is full of choices, and uh, sometimes there isn't there isn't like a there isn't like a right way to, to do anything. So you just have to make a, a judgment call really for yourself. Um, next question, blah, blah, blah. I really enjoyed your podcasts. Uh, I have a question. I have a question about climbing steep snow. I had a couple of seasons in the Alps and would like to progress to harder routes. The friend or the me, the me, me got, where's the me, me, me got, me got, Swiss route, etc. However, these all involve climbing steep snow with limited options for protection. Due to the terrain, some of these routes seem impossible to have at least one piece of gear in. Is it just a case of concentrating on your footwork and moving up the pitch unprotected? I have seen recommendations for snow stakes and dead men, although usually at anchors, but they seem cumbersome to use as runners. Should I look... Uh, to get mileage in moving on unprotected snow so I don't freak out on bigger routes? If so, can you recommend any less serious objectives? Many thanks, Liam. So, so yeah, because this kind of fits, this kind of ties into the to the other question. So now, so Liam here is talking about more technical routes. Like the Swiss routes on Swiss route on the courts isn't really technical. Uh, like, the, like the North Face of Duats is, like I, I soloed, the North Face of Duats uh, in like 90, uh, 1998 or something. And there's only really, you know, like like 20, 20 feet of, of grade five, like ice probably on it. And the rest of it is, is, is more, more kind of straightforward, but you are like a thousand meters off the ground. So if you, you know, if you, if you, if you make a mistake, it's, it's more serious. But I, I would say first of all, I don't know if Liam's from the UK or where he lives, but the most important thing about these routes is to do them in condition. Because if you, if you're like, you know, the, 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 it's like, it's probably a little bit like kayaking. So if you go and try and kayak this famous, dangerous, you know, white water, rapid kind of thing, you know, the, the, the witch's cauldron or something, and you go there in the middle of a drought... Like you're not you're not going to go anywhere. You're just going to be sitting in your in your kayak in a in a stream bed. If you go there in like a ginormous storm, hellish storm, you know you're just going to get killed immediately. So it's all about it's all about getting the timing. And I think alpin alpinism is really really about that. Like if you're going to do if you're going to do more technical routes, so like the friend or spare is mainly kind of rock climbing with the isoret thing at the top. And you can probably you can probably wing the friend or spare, and because lots of people have, but the but not the Swiss routes on the courts. Because if you get on a route like that and there's not enough ice and it's just like blank slabs of rock with snow on it, then a, it's really really almost impossible to climb it. It tends from being like a grade three, you know, plod with some little tiny steps of steeper stuff, but never very steep. To being like a grade, you know, a grade eight mixed climb. So, so it's all about getting the conditions. So you ha- you need to get these routes when they have a lot of coverage of of ice and neve, not ice, ideally neve, and they need it needs to go from the top to the bottom. You need a, a good weather forecast because there are just a giant big funnel of snow and everything else, and uh, you know. You know, like, you know, you need to keep an eye out, see if other people are climbing these routes, what the conditions are like. Sometimes the route can be, you know, really good at the bottom, at the, and the top can be like really, really horrible. And 
lots of snow and everything else. Um, if it gets too cold, then if there's ice, the ice can be too uh, brittle. So it's really about keeping an eye on it. Like if you if you spend any time in the Alps, you'll notice that the good climbers don't really climb very often. They just sort of sit around, you know, they go on the road bikes or whatever. They don't, they don't really do They go skiing and stuff in the wintertime. And then they'll just hear that, like, beyond good and evil's in condition or, you know, the you know, Colton, the, uh, the McIntyre is, is in, in condition and they'll, like, zoom out there and they'll race up it and it'll be easy. Where if you're, like, a, a Brit or someone else, you, like, rock up there and you'll get on one of these routes out of condition and it'll be a fucking nightmare and you'll just, you'll take 10 times as long and you'll nearly die and it'll be it'll be horrendous and you'll have like stories i think i think someone told me a story about doing the courts i think they had like one ice screw in i think it wasn't an ice screw it was actually a, one of those ice like an ice peg like a like a uh warthog and it was only i think it was in the ice and that was the bee layer and the guy he was with fell off and he fell onto the bee layer and the warthog like bent in half and then didn't but didn't come out of the ice and that's like saved them and you know there's like lots of lots of stories but like gear the gear and stuff's improved like boots have improved crampons are better but when you're on like a big ice face uh like you don't you're not gonna you don't you don't you can't really pitch those kind of routes like you could you know pitch people have pitched like the north face of duats and they'll climb the first bit up to the head wall uh like pitch the whole thing you'll start at midnight and they'll pitch the whole thing. Uh, like you, you, like if you're fast and you're efficient, then maybe you can pitch these kind of things. But it's very it's sometimes very hard to get like a, a belay that you would actually trust on that kind of thing. You really are just, you know, trusting that you can uh, you can climb up and down safely. And I think you can usually tell when you're on the angle where you don't feel comfortable. You, you know, you you it's just get, you know once once you start having your once you start thinking I might fall off here that's when you need to not be climbing up something like that that's when you need to like go back down again because it's okay to think like that when you're doing technical climbing but not when you're doing uh this you know this this kind of thing so uh so i would i would probably recommend to liam is to stick to the buttresses is you know instead of doing something like the swiss route on the courts like depending what you've done already like climbing if you're if you're a Brit and you've been climbing in Scotland and you're doing routes in Scotland, I would I would like suggest you try m- more like mixed you know mixed routes like the the second so the first route I did in the Alps was a winter ascent of the Frendo Spur, which was like you know horrendous experience. Dropped my boot and everything. I've it's all I've written all about it, but it was a horrendous experience. But it was a really, but it was very, very safe in retrospect. We always had a belay, you know, we were, we were really, really safe. And then the next route was a northeast bear, the Dwats, again in the winter time. And again, we had all, all sorts of epics. And it was, uh, uh, but it was like safe. We always had belays, and um, you know, it was like a really good learning kind of ex- experience. So, so I guess all the, all the routes I've always done in the Alps, always those kind of routes. And I would say. You know, you can get on these routes, and if you can't do them, then you can you can always like you know wrap off them and stuff. You know, it's, but it's it's kind of harder to wrap off the middle of a uh, you know a huge kind of ice face. And I really feel like those these ice face routes are a kind of uh, you know the, the the climates you know obviously getting you know obviously obviously like warming. So these the you know the the winters are not as you know you're not get, they're not building up as well as they is the used to so you have to be careful not to end up trying these routes that are not really climbable like for all the time where they pass they probably you could probably climb them you know all all the, all the winter like the, the weather's you know, i remember like when i when i was doing these routes like in the 90s and people like rab carrington were telling me that oh this that wasn't a winter winter ascent like the winters in the 70s were much colder than this so you know the, the weather's been like the winters have been getting like more milder uh you know, but then I think last time I was in the Alps, they had like record amount of snow. It was like Baltically cold, so you just you you never you never know. Like I don't really believe, you know, I'm not I'm not saying I'm a I'm not a, a climate change skeptic because the you know the the climate is like always changing and uh, like when you go if you if you travel like I, I'm I'm you know I'm interested in history and if you travel on the world you travel on the world you go to these places. 
and you'll read about you know like the settlers who first came to places and they'll you'll just read about the most horrendous you know effects of climate on you know early settlers to you know to Canada or Australia or New Zealand and things and uh, basically the weather's just uh, you know not it's the weather's a really deadly you know element cause it, it never stays it never stays the same it's always like changing so so yeah but and but as as for actually like you you it's very important to learn how to climb snow or snare if you come from a hole uh, and it's not and you do need to kind of do your uh do your do your what's it called do your um your apprenticeship on 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 snow climbing because you do end up climbing some routes you know where the routes that, where the snow can be really really steep like you just got like un- unconsolidated snow that maybe is like 80 degree angle or something that like you can get some really horrendous um experiences of snow um snow and like rime and all the kind of weird you know you basically go from ice you know like transparent ice you know all the way through to this kind of horrible i think mark twight he calls it like the you know like ice inside of a freezer you know you, you get all these like weird kinds of ice and snows and uh, that is is really important to learn how to climb that st- kind of stuff it's very important if you're climbing over a bergstrand to be able to understand how it, how all that kind of shit works and sometimes you get you know sections of climbs where the where it's like steep and it's covered in snow so uh like a really so yeah so it's basically understanding what's going to take you away like sometimes you end up just like like chimneying up inside the snow and you you, know, you, you uh, like often you have to use your knees that like you you'll like pat you like pad down the snow underneath you to make it solid and you'll you'll stand upon that then you'll do the same thing again and you're basically building like a platform but you have no protection whatsoever so you you cannot afford to fall off so if you're just trusting you know so many times it's a bit like scrambling where you're like if my foot if my knee slips here i'm going to die you know because there's so 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 you do need to be quite good at doing that kind of stuff uh like you know using your your entire arms to like pushing into the snow and how you can use your ice axes and cam them into the snow and and also often being being able to like dig 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 all the way down into the into the rock whether some rock or there's something you can find some protection in there so all these uh you just got to take your time you can't really you can't really rush that kind of stuff like sometimes you need to have a shovel like having a shovels um you know really really handy just literally just like dig yourself uh you know through this thing i know like don willens he used like an entrenching tool because an entrenching tool you could have the the ads the uh the the spade like set at um 90 degrees is that 90 degrees yeah 90 degrees um you know so you could use it like a big like a giant ads and, th- and stuff so so yeah and as, as for protection on snow and snare then um yeah, like a, a, a snow stake is is a good piece of gear to actually invest in. Like if you're climbing these gullies and these easy routes, not, yeah, maybe in the Alps, maybe you'd use one in the Alps. Uh, really, really, really good to get hold of one. Um, buy, like, probably MSR, probably make the most common one, uh, and buy one with like a fitted metal um, strop in the middle, you know, like the in the balance point. In the right, right in the middle of the of the stake, and you can use it. It makes a very effective like T anchor, where you like make a T and you put it down there, and the cable's coming out. And it makes a very you can use it as a as a standard, you know, like hammer it in kind of a like a stake, snow stake kind of anchor. And you can do all the, the really really ha- really handy things, and the super, you know, the super light. And uh, like learn how to do like a stomper beeler. That's a kind of a handy one to know. Um, yeah, you know, just just learn up, learn up. Yeah, you know, just just learn up, learn up. Yeah, you know, just just learn up, learn up. Yeah, you know, just just learn up, learn up. Yeah, you know, just just learn up, learn up. The bee lane and see if two of you can pull it out. Um, like I had a, I had a photograph on my Instagram and it was from down. It was actually a a, a Dachstein mitt with a Mars bar inside it, stuffed with snow, which was a an anchor like a, a Scottish classic, like Scottish winter climbing anchor. And then, because my dad, had, I think my dad had told, told me about this kind of anchor, and and someone told me, and and someone told me, and and someone told me, uh, the Dachstein mitt. I don't think I don't think it had a Mars bar in it, in the, like a you know cut a slot, put the mitt in there, put the rope around it, and he said there was like four of them, and they couldn't they couldn't get it to come out. So 
So yeah, so so the, the snow is your is your friend really, but you just have to know how to, you know, how to how to handle it really. So I think that I think maybe that's <clears throat> I'm, I'm I'm going I'm I'm losing my <clears throat> my voice now, so I need to go and have another cup of tea. So uh, I shall leave it there. Like I have had like a lot of questions, like tons and tons and tons of questions about um i've got one i've got one last question here i'll run to answer that we have a lot of questions about soloing devices and i do apologize if i've not replied to them but, but this is something i think i'm gonna have to do on my if i do a video so if, if you want to if you want to listen to something about soloing and soloing devices and that kind of stuff then um i probably need to do it with some visual aids uh dig out my silent partner and all that kind of crap so so follow me on um Follow me on uh, YouTube. I think it's like, and just type in Andy Kirkpatrick, you'll find it. Anyway, I'll just answer this last question because it, uh, it's like, hey, Andy, I'm just wondering if you used a Dyneema sling as a Prusik third hand when abseiling or hauling. I know there are concerns of a melting and slippiness, but I've heard some people do use that. I thought you'd be the best person to ask since you cut the waffle and go straight for the practical. God, God, he's not probably always doesn't know what I'm like these days. Uh, so, some um, a bit of data for you here. So, so you, it's good to you got to separate out um, Dyneema slings, separate separate Dyneema from Kevlar and nylon. So nylon melts at like 250 degrees Celsius, Kevlar melts at 500 degrees Celsius. And Dyneema melts at 145 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, Dyneema, Dyneema melts very, very easily. Um, like if you, if you, you know, just just hold a, if you've got a bit of, da, of da Kevlar, Dyneema and uh, nylon, you know, as soon as you put the match or any kind of heat near the, the Dyneema, it kind of like shrivels up immediately. So it's got a low, you know, a very, a very um, low, low melting point. Is that low melting point? No, low... Yeah, melting point. Um, but but the question is, like a lot of these things, you get there's a lot of stuff that people. This is a classic forum climbing forum question, where you'll get like fifty people saying like, "Oh, don't do it. Never use a nylon. Sl- never use a Dyneema sling. You will die for sure." Blah blah blah. Look at this test. Blah blah blah. And then you'll get one person who's like a you know mountain guide. You know, German old German mountain guide like I always was dining my slings it as the best, and there'll be you know people like you don't know what you're talking about. So I would uh, the it's all about what you use them for basically. So I would say the bigger the biggest the bigger issue for me is that Dyneema is not very grippy. It's like amazingly slippery kind of material, and anybody who like the the the, the cohesion the cohesion ability of the thing is really, really important like how how much it can deform and grip around something that's why like i've got like you know prusik prusik loops that just don't work they're just made out of stuff that's just too stiff they will they just will not grip to anything uh they, you know unless you get exactly the right knot and be really really careful where like a really really old piece of uh you know six mil or whatever seven mil five mil uh you know very very old cord it's very flexible it's a bit fared up and everything else like those will like like grip right super 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 well now the the now the default i would say the default uh prusik at the moment or friction hitch like in in the book i've got rid of got with i'm trying to not use the word prusik because or prusik loop because there's a lot of prusiks <laughs> That aren't prusiks that you don't tie a classic prusik knot, so that, that confuses some people. And also, uh, often it's not a loop either. So, so but the probably the best, the best um, sort of prusik friction hitch loop type thing at the moment is uh, the 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 six point eight millimeter hollow block ones that Sterling make, a Sterling ropes. I think you seem to buy them most places. If you look in. Um, uh, uh tree surgery places you know they, they sell this kind of stuff as well but it's it's made out of uh, kevlar so first of all it's got really it's like it's incredibly tough it's like twice as strong as um i think it's like 60 percent stronger than 
is any it's, it's fucking strong. You're not going to break it. It's really really strong. It's made out of Kevlar, so it's very resistant resistant to heat. So it's not it's not going to you know wear when you when you're using it when you're abseiling as a as like a third hand and stuff. And it's quite it's uh, it's very very grippy. Like the a hollow hollow block is basically like a instead of a, a rope where you've got the the core and the sheath. I think a hollow block is just basically all like sheath. It's like a very thick you know, hollow block of hollow tube of, of uh, Kevlar and it's got, and it's sewn together. Like I've got a, like a VT one, which is like a, you know, like a, 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 a length of co- a length of Kevlar with two loops on the either end, which is really, really handy. And I've also got a loop as well to so carry like two, two plus six. And uh, that, like I would, I would highly recommend investing in, in, in like a Kevlar s- sewn together, um, you know, kind of a, a, a prosthetic loop for, for for various reasons. Really, 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 really handy. Uh, much better than like cord is kind of good because it's you can dis- dispose of it more easily. And you should always remember that you can use if you've got like a seven millimeter cordlet. Then if you've got double ropes, you can use you can use uh, you can use that on, on you know seven mils probably getting a bit too thick if you've got a really really skinny rope. But you can use it on double ropes. So if you were setting up a whole system, you've got like two ropes. You can use it for that, and you can use it for various things. So, but back, but so the the question is like if you're if you're in a position where you don't have a prosthetic loop, and you need to use like the the main the, the two times you're going to use this is when you, when you want to have like a backup when you're abseiling, or when you're like you've fallen off and you're hanging in space and you can't get back on, or you just can't climb the pitch. Like I did a route. Uh, last year where I just could not I, just, I was really really cold and I just could not do the because you know I did one of these things where you you do like a six meter abseil down it was like in the Blue Mountains in Australia and it was like Baltically cold it was in the winter time Baltically cold really really windy and you wrap, we wrapped down to the bottom of this wall and started climbing up and then the sun went off the crag and it just got absolutely freezing cold and then Vanessa was like climbing you know she was really cold leading a pitch and i got really cold waiting and then i when it came to lead to second i just was like so cold i was couldn't feel my hands and i kept falling off so i ended up i so saw i you know i had to use a um prosthetic loop but in that case on that on that in that on that example i think we had like a a seven mil like 7.1 millimeter we had two ropes one was like 7.1 and i had to try and you know put you know prusik up on this 7.1 millimeter rope and i had i had uh, the the prusik loop um 6.8 millimeter prusik loop and it wouldn't it wouldn't grip for some reason just wouldn't i just got it to grip on the rope so if i had like a five millimeter uh standard prusik loop maybe it would have worked maybe maybe i just did it wrong but anyway but that's often the way i remember climbing in alaska and we had like 8.1 millimeter ropes and some paul ramsen had one of those plastic uh, plastic ice screw holding device on his harness and something happened. I can't remember what happened, but it basically snapped off. It just like ripped off the harness. Even though it was a black diamond harness, it wasn't very well, the, how it was made, it wasn't very, it wasn't just, it just ripped off and all the screws fell down the couloir. So we had to go, we had to go down. I think I, I think I, I think we tied both the ropes together and I managed to wrap like 120 meters down there, down to over the bag shrunt. And then I had like two of those rope men, wild country rope men. And then I'll, be, I'll just like, I'll just zoom all the way back up again. And the rope men would not grip on the rope. They just kept sliding, sliding down the rope. So it's like Murphy's Law, like whenever these things happen, you know, shit doesn't work. So it's good to have tried it beforehand. Um, but uh, a, dynamo, a dynamo sling, you can use a dynamo sling. It will, it will work. Hopefully it will work. Uh, there's basically you the best way to do it so this is why it'd be good to have a video but um it's, it's called like an f if you look up if you type in like fb fb prusik fb like for um it's a german guy's name uh i can't remember his name now um was it franz franz backman franz backman prusik and you'll see a few different versions of it but basically where you've got the stitching on the on the sling. Imagine like a classic French prusik, a, fr- pr- a classic prusik knot, where you just like, you know, you you you've got a loop and the and the it goes around the rope, through the loop, around the rope, through the loop, around the rope. So it, you've got like 
you know, uh, uh, six sort of loops with the rope coming, the rope coming out the middle of it. So you, you you kind of do that kind of thing, but you where your initial loop is, where the where the where the sling is passing through, that's where the uh, stitching is on the on the sling, and that and and that works pretty well. And you, I think you do like one, two, three, four. Is it four loops? Uh, Four loops, you can you can do like six loops, but you've you just do a few loops and uh, and that and that tends that does tend to work. Uh, the other way you can do more of a is a, is a like a climb heist where you just uh, you wrap it around and then you pass. So you have that you have the the stitching at the very very bottom and then you wrap the, the the sling around the rope going upwards and then you pass it back down through the through where the the stitching is um, and that creates like the the capturing kind of loop at the bottom of the prusik. Um, but one one thing I use quite a lot if I if I'm sort of abseiling and I've forgotten a bit of a prusik to to abseil with, I often use like a uh, I always like I carry quite a few thirty centimeter quick draws uh, like open quick draws that you can use for because a lot of people they make the mistake that all the quick draws are too short they've all got these like. 15 centimeter ones you know 10 centimeter ones which are just not they're no use whatsoever apart from sport climbing so i, I all my quick draws are quite long so they're, they're like 20 they're either 20 20 or 20 or 30 centimeters long and uh they're all the the 20 ones are usually like express ones so they're like sewn together and the, the other ones are longer and the longer ones because they're open you can f- feed them through pegs and you can tie things off with them they're kind of handy so but I, I, I always have like two. I always have two like lock draw, quick draws, where it's a a draw with a small screw at one end and a carabiner on the other one, other end. And and they and they work really well if you have to use it as a prusik. So you just you just tie a a an auto block prusik with the with the sling, uh, clip it back into the. So you, you know you got the, the 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 locker on one end. You know clip that into your harness, wrap the thing around, clip it back into the locker, and you're away. And a low, like maybe maybe a, maybe Dyneema has got a lower ability. It's got a lower ability to grip the rope. It doesn't really matter if using it as a third hand below your belay device because the actual force on the rope is actually very very low because the belay device is taking nearly all the force, all the weight, and it's just there as a you know it's very very. You could probably you can like hold the rope with your fingers and it'll stop, you know fingertips. So it's so that's a. That's a good thing. So, so yeah, so they do work, uh, but you wouldn't want to like go around using a prusik, uh, uh, like a backup made out of a, a Dyneema sling, all the time because what would happen? It would like rapidly wear wear out. Like you know, within like you know five or six wraps, it would probably start like seriously degrading how strong it is. And then if that sling ended up being used as like protection and you fell on it, it probably could snap because slings are actually not that s- slings are very very strong when they're brand new. But they're not that strong when they're like when they're knackered, and that's why you should always replace all the all your slings fairly, you know, every every few years. Because in the past you had these like troll blue blue super chip super tube slings, which were, you know, they were like probably forty kilonewtons in strength. They were like, you know, crazy strong, and those things could last you like twenty years. But now you've got slings which are designed to just get in in you know. To the rating, they're not designed to be any stronger than ex- the max, the minimum. So those kind of slings, they got less leeway for them to to last. So yeah, um, but any, but try it out. You know, don't take my word for it. You know, go to the climbing wall, go to a tree. You know, go in your back garden. Uh, if you're getting a rope out, throw it over a tree. Make sure that no one thinks you're doing anything else. And uh, yeah, try it. Try it out. You might think you might find it doesn't work. So it's at least you know. And I don't. I'm only going by what I think, not what I know. So, that's, yeah. anyway, so that'll be it. I shall go and my. I shall go and watch Grand Designs, and uh, like everybody else is probably doing right now. And I shall talk to you soon. Goodbye.